Thank you so much for joining us. Um, please take a seat. We are about to begin our presentation. This is our English presentation for the Bakersfield to Palmdale section of the California High Speed Rail Project. Uh, tonight we will be focusing primarily on Edison. However, we will be taking a, having discussion about the project as a whole, as well as going through various maps associated with the Bakersfield to Palmdale section. Um, we have a variety of people who will be speaking tonight. Um, some engineers, our Southern California Regional Director, Michelle Bame. We also have some of our environmental specialists. Uh, if, in fact, you have specific questions about your uh, business or home or any of those questions, please do have those conversations with our specialists at the various stations that we have here tonight. However, if you have a general question, we are going to have a facilitated Q&A, question and answer period, following the presentation. Please do fill out a question card. Uh, Annette and Claudia is over here with the uh, question card. So if you do have a question, please fill that out, and we're happy to answer those questions. So tonight, we will be going over a few different items. Uh, first, we will be having a kind of a global discussion about high-speed rail, a statewide discussion about the program as a whole. Uh, we will be specifically talking about, as I said before, the Bakersfield to Palmdale section, going through a variety of maps, trying to ensure that everyone understands where the alignment is, how we came to, you know, uh, the, uh, the alternatives that we're currently looking at, uh, and, and taking your input. It's really important that if, in fact, you have either questions or comments, that you filled out, fill out a comment card, fill out a question card, because that's, that really helps us understand what your concerns might be and what your questions might be. So again, we have a comment station in the back. If you do fill out a, a comment card, please uh, submit it, uh, and we will make sure that we contact you with, with an answer. Uh, we will also be talking about high-speed rail project features, uh, as well as the environmental process. And so now, with, without further ado, Michelle Baim, our Regional Director for Southern California. Thank you, Valerie. And I wanted to thank everybody for coming to our meeting tonight. These meetings are absolutely invaluable to the authority as we work to plan the best route for the high-speed train. Being able to talk with community members and understand what you know about your community is really, really valuable and really does help us. Our project does reflect uh, the information that we learn uh, from these meetings, so I wanted to thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us tonight um, to talk about the California High Speed Rail Program. You can see here on the map the 800-mile all-electric California high-speed rail project that the, California, uh, the state of California is planning and building right now. You can also see on the map uh, the locations where we plan to put the stations along this alignment. We are planning to put stations in the heart of eight of the ten largest cities by population in the state of California and connect the regions of California, north, central, and south with fast, safe, electric transportation in a way that we have not had uh, to date. This is really important to the state of California because California is a growing state. Our population continues to grow, and by the middle of this century, we will be adding 12 million people to our population, basically kind of the equivalent of all of the state of Ohio moving to the state of California. And so we need to make sure that we're planning for the future and to be successful in the 21st century, and mobility is one of those key aspects that we need to look at. Mobility is critical to our economy, it's critical to our quality of life, and that's why the state of California is planning this project. This project is all electric, as I mentioned, so this project also contributes to us having better air quality in the future, which is also important to us 
throughout the state of California, particularly in the southern region and in the central region where we are tonight. And one of the things that a lot of people ask when we go to these meetings is, when is the California State High-Speed Rail project going to happen? And the answer is, it's happening right now. This project is under construction as we speak. We have 119 miles of projects under multiple construction contract. We have multiple locations that are under construction and we are investing billions of dollars right now in the Central Valley. This is ground zero where this project is starting. Uh, we started in the Fresno County area, we'll be moving into construction in the Kern County area, and in Fresno County, with the start of this project, we, uh, the, job, the jobless rate has been dramatically reduced by over 10 percentage points. So as you build a project of this size and complexity, we also are adding jobs to the economy now, and we will be adding jobs to the economy later because we will need to take care of the trains, take care of the system, operate our stations, all of those kinds of great things. And so this is really a project for now and for the future. Today, though, we're here to talk about specific project components of the Palm, uh, Bakersfield to Palmdale project. This section is one of the longer sections in our phase one system. It's about 80 miles, and it connects the Central Valley to Southern California, the high desert and LA County. And that is a really critical connection for the state of California. We don't currently have a safe and efficient passenger rail connection between the Central Valley and Southern California. If you want to take a train from Bakersfield to Los Angeles, you actually get on a bus in Bakersfield and take that to LA Union Station, and then you could continue your trip from there. So being able to provide this, uh, close this rail gap for the state of California is really, really a big idea in terms of improving mobility for the state. But this is a really, really diverse region, as you know. We start here in Bakersfield, which is one of our top 10 cities by population, and then we go south of here through this community here of Edison along the 58 freeway, and then we go up and cross the Tehachapi Mountains. This is a rail crossing that hasn't been uh, built since the 19th century. Our rail line right now was built across in the 19th century, not the 20th century, right? And we are building a 21st century rail connection now across the Tehachapi Mountains. But we're passing natural lands, we're going across uh, rivers and streams and valleys, uh, and so there's a lot of diversity in things that we need to take a look at. Uh, we go across the plateau at Tehachapi, and then we continue to move down the south side of the Tehachapi Mountains into the high desert and the Antelope Valley, passing through Lancaster and ultimately coming to a station stop at Palmdale. So that's what we're doing. Lots of uh, uh, information that we need to gather about this project, lots of technical studies that we need to do to make sure that we can build this project, and your feedback helps us to do that. Here is the timeline uh, for the California High Speed Rail project. We are operating right now in basically the middle of this timeline. There's a little bracket that says draft EIR EIS and final EIR EIS. That is what we are working on today. But you can see it in the context of starting the plan for the project and operating trains. One end in 2005 to the other end in 2029 when we will begin operating our electric trains from San Francisco all the way to Anaheim. 
We have a, a really exciting opportunity to be able to start operating the trains from the Kern County area up to San Jose in 2025 so we can begin to get passengers on the system to enjoy the benefits and then we will continue uh, to bring the system both all the way into the city of San Francisco and all the way down to Anaheim. And in order to do this, and I've uh, kind of alluded to this, this is a very, very complex project uh, to, to build, to plan and build. And we have established this graphic to explain to people what we're doing and thinking about when we're coming up with the best route to build. We really have to strike a balance. Uh, among uh, many components and things that we think about in order to identify that best possible project. And in the one circle, we have the project objectives. We have to build a safe train. That is non-negotiable. We have to build a fast train. That is our charge. We have to make sure we put stations in the heart of the cities where the most people will have access to use this train. That is our responsibility. Those are the things that we look at in that area. Then over to the side, we also have the environmental resources. When you're building a project of this size, we need to make sure that we're protecting our wildlands, our water, our plants, and our animals. Uh, we're improving air quality. Um, all of those kinds of things that we work with resource agencies to make sure that we're protecting. And then not by accident, at the top, we have our communities. When we build a project like this, we are traveling through some of our most precious communities in the state of California. And in order to do that and make sure that those communities can maintain the character that they have today and grow into the future vision for that community that they see, we have to understand them inside and out so that we make sure that we're making the best possible choices that we can. Uh, and in order to get that information from the communities, we go out and we intake that in a lot of different ways. We have meetings like the meeting we're having tonight. We've had several other uh, meetings very similar in this location in the past. We meet with people one-on-one. -on -one. We go and talk to community groups um, so that we bring the project to them rather than having you come to us so that we can solicit this information and understand uh, what it is that we need to know to do the best job we can. And what happens when we strike this balance, when we put that balance in play, the project objectives, the environmental resources, and the community, the project changes over time and it gets better and better. And you can see those changes over time for the Bakersfield to Palmdale section from 2010 to 2016. The feedback that we've gotten from communities, the inf technical information we've gained from studies, the discussions we've had with resource agencies have all allowed us to improve this alignment to what you see today on this picture in 2016. Uh, we are still working on this. We continue to work on this and that's why we're here today with this meeting. We have solved many of the challenges that we were faced with at the beginning, but we have additional challenges that we still want to be able to solve. And so here basically is a more detailed map of what we're studying today. Uh, I would draw your attention to the color on this map because it's very, very uh, instructive. Where you see green, that is where the project would be built on the ground. It would be built on the ground maybe a little bit below the current level of the ground or a little bit above the current level of the ground, but that's where the project rests on the ground. Where you see the blue, that's where our project would be on a bridge. We bridge over roadways, we bridge over valleys. Those are the kinds of features that uh, you would expect a bridge in those locations. And where it is pink or purplish, that is where we would be in a tunnel. 
And in those locations, basically, we're building our, uh, we're planning our project very straight and flat. And as we cross the Tehachapi's, the mountains come up uh, in front of that straight line. And where the mountains come up in front of that straight line, we tunnel underneath them to get to the other side. And I'm gonna turn it over now to our project manager for this section, Juan Carlos Velasquez, who will walk you through some of the more specific details of the project throughout the section. Yes, as, as Michelle mentioned, um, I'm gonna walk through a snapshot of a few locations um, along the route and describe it in a little more detail to get an idea of what it might look like in that particular area. So starting um, here as we exit through Bakersfield, um, we are on a bridge structure, a, a, via, a viaduct, um, and you see that uh, blue line on the left of, this, of that map on the upper right, um, and that's coming from the, state, the proposed station locations. And as you see, as it runs along the Edison Highway um, corridor, as we get to Edison, it, it switches over and goes over uh, and parallels the 58 freeway. And you can see a, a picture of what that might look like on the lower left as it's crossing, um, running along the 58 or crossing over the 58, it would be on a bridge structure uh, similar to that. In other areas um, where you see the green, as Michelle mentioned, it would be you know, maybe on the ground, um, but not necessarily at the same level as the ground. Here, for example, it would be raised uh, uh, slightly so that when it comes to a road, we can bridge over that road. Um, one of the key considerations here, specifically in Edison, that I'll mention is that um, in working with the Edison School District and this school here, um, um, we have moved the alignment um, closer to the 58 or, or across on the other side of the 58 from the, in this particular um, area to, to minimize any potential impacts to um, the school here. Um, further to the south, um, you see another picture here um, as we're starting to, <clears throat> on the north side of the Tachapes, you'll start to see some of the pink um, tunnel areas um, as we uh, hit some of the, the higher mountains and, and you see some blue areas where you see the valleys. Um, you can see when, when we do hit those valleys, a uh, picture on the lower right, um, what some of those bridge structures might look like. And again, because we're such a straight alignment, um, when valleys drop off, um, we end up with these, these types of bridges. Um, in shorter tunnels, you could see the picture on the upper left, um, you see the an oval shape. Um, for shorter tunnels like what's seen on the map here, you know, less than a mile, um, you know, we may have a single tunnel with a, with a wall in between and, and one track on each side of that wall, and that's what that picture is indicating there. Further up in the Tachapes, um, as you see the climb there, um, you start to see some longer tunnel areas, um, you know, deeper canyons, things like that. Uh, so in, in these areas uh, where we have the longer tunnels, we would have uh, two tunnels one in each direction for the, each track, um, um, and they would be uh, connected with uh, passageways at certain intervals, and this would be for emergency purposes. Um, in other areas, it would be on a, a, an, a slight raised a ground, you know, what's called a, an embankment or a fill. In other areas, that, that would be reversed, where we'd be slightly below the ground, like in a cut situation. And then um, the picture you see on the lower left is in Tehachapi, where we will be slightly elevated so that we can cross over uh, the 58 or the railroad tracks or other features in the city of Tehachapi. Um, in that area, we're going generally around the city. Um, as we get close uh, on the south end, this is where our longest tunnels are in the Tehachapi, and you can see those long purple lines there, and, and again, bridging over certain things um, and um, being on the ground in other areas. Um, here, and, and then once we get into the Antelope Valley, it's very, fairly flat, so you see mostly green um, with a lot of blue areas in between. Um, the picture on the lower right is a picture at crossing Roseman Avenue, and this is very typical. We would be on a slightly elevated embankment fill area um, with bridges over the roads that cross. And this is important for communities like that to make sure that we're not disrupting the road network, the road network can stay where it is, and we're just kind of bridging over um, those roads to allow c uh, connectivity around the community the way they're currently uh, doing it. And then um, as we get into Lancaster, finally we join the uh, existing rail corridor. The lower right picture shows um, what's there now is they have Sierra Highway, um, the Metrolink line and the Union Pacific line, kind of similar to the Edison Highway and the Union Pacific line that's, that's here. Um, but here we would be adding the high-speed rail in this corridor. 
Um, so we have a couple of alternatives where in order to get the high speed rail, we have to widen this corridor a little bit to the west or a little bit to the east. So there's two different options that we're looking at in Lancaster. Um, and then finally down similarly in Palmdale, we're in the same corridor going along that um, Sierra Highway along uh, in front of the, the Palmdale um, airport, the, the Plant 42 area, and to our station in Palmdale. Um, we're designing that station in Palmdale to connect to um, the High Desert Corridor, which is a uh, rail corridor that would connect Palmdale to Victorville with a separate project called Express West that would connect a train from Palm, uh, Victorville to Las Vegas. So um, those trains from Las Vegas, we are designing the station at Palmdale so that the tracks can come in and use that station as well. Uh, Rick Simon, our lead engineer, will talk uh, a few more specific details about the, the project. So we've talked a lot about the alignment of the project. There's a little more detail to that, uh, a lot to this system than instead of just the alignment. Uh, these are electrical powered trains. We'll have overhead uh, wires that supply power to the trains. And to support that electrical system, uh, at about five mile intervals along the alignment, we will have little substations. And you see one in the upper right picture there is a sample of one. These have different functions. Some of them will be where we're supplying power to the train. Some of these would be where we're switching the power feed from one substation to another, and some of them would be where we're, the power is being balanced uh, along the alignment, so the train will have a constant power feed as it goes along the, the, uh, the alignment. We will also have an uh, intrusion protection system. Uh, you see a picture of that in the lower right. Uh, our corridor needs to be sealed so that we do not have people cars, animals, or anything on our tracks at the, at the speeds we're operating. We do not want to have anything on our right-of-way. So we'll have fencing, uh, uh, barriers, uh, different types of fencing, and also electronic systems to not only keep uh, things off the track, but also detect that. If anything happens, we'll, we'll detect that, and we'll be able to either stop the trains or get, uh, uh, you know, get things removed from the right-of-way and keep the trains operating. We'll also be having an early earthquake warning system. Uh, this will be patterned after the system that's in place in Japan. Uh, Japan's been running high-speed trains for over 50 years, and they have a lot of seismic activity there. They have a warning system where uh, as soon as the initial P wave of the earthquake is detected, it sends out electrical signals and cuts the power to the train systems and brings the trains to a stop before the major shaking uh, reaches where the trains are. It's been a very successful system. They've had a lot of major earthquakes in Japan. They've been operating their trains for 50 years and have never had a passenger fatality. We'll have the same type of system here in California. It'll be very useful for our train system. It'll also be used, have, have many other applications for California in terms of uh, detection of earthquakes, minimizing uh, injuries and fatalities, and also aiding in emergency response. Our system is, has to be fully grade separated from the roadway system. A lot of the existing freight trains have road crossings where the road and rail cross at the same elevation. We can't have that. We will be fully grade separated. So we either go over roadways uh, on the embankment with a bridge. Some of those, road, we leave those roadways alone and go over them. Others, we may have to modify the roadways and either take them up and over us or take them down underneath us. But we'll be fully grade separated from every roadway in the corridor. And you see a list here, we actually cross uh, between Bakersfield and Palmdale, we have 73 road crossings. You see a list of them there and where they are located. We've talked a little bit about the stations uh, in Bakersfield. We have two options that are still being studied. Uh, we have a detailed map over in the far table over there if you want to look at the detail of those two options. Uh, and then in Palmdale, we have our station option near the existing Metrolink station. And on that graphic, if you look closely, you see some dashed yellow lines, and that is the alignment coming in from the east, from Las Vegas and Victorville, that could come in and connect with our system at Palmdale. Those, those trains could go on down into Los Angeles. And with that, I will turn it over to Stephanie Roberts to talk about the environmental analysis.
Good evening. So we're in the middle of our environmental process currently. The environmental process started in 2009 when we began what's called a scoping. So that's when we started looking at the initial alternatives that Michelle had pointed out previously in the presentation. Through that time, we went and we evolved the alternatives. We submitted an alternatives analysis back in 2012. And in 2016, we issued our supplemental alternatives analysis, which is available on the authority's website. That alternatives analysis narrowed it down to the four alternatives that we are studying as part of our environmental document. If you see the little red dot up on the screen, that's where we are now, which is the environmental and analysis part of this. We are currently undergoing these studies. When we are done with our analysis, the staff will recommend a preferred alternative to the board and to the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, at that point, when they accept that, we will issue our draft environmental document, hopefully toward the midpoint of this year. And we will come out for public comment and have public hearings and then take all that information, go back and finalize our environmental document um, hopefully a year or so from now and that will be published and once that's done we can begin construction on the project hopefully. The environmental document consists of many different things, not just the things that are obvious like transportation or noise. We look at flora and fauna, water. We also look at the communities. We look at the cohesion. We look at economic impacts. We look at demographics. Um, we also look at things like your parks and utilities and regional growth. So all of these put together is how the authority will come up with what they think is the best preliminary, preliminary preferred alternative for the project. During the environmental analysis phase that we're in, we do a lot of different types of studies. We do data collection, literature review. Uh, we had folks go out and actually do field studies and surveys. We use geographic information system mapping and we use some remote sensing and modeling. So there's a lot of different parts and a lot of different information where we gather to do our analysis of all the different resources. During our environmental analysis, the first thing we try to do is avoid. That's mainly during the scoping part. And we try to, we try to not hit as many important resources and locations as possible. The next thing we do is once we kind of narrow down where our, where our alternatives want to go is we try to minimize. So through the design process with the engineering team, we try to see where we can do tweaks um, to the alternatives to see how we can further avoid impacts. At that point, um, when we do acknowledge that there are impacts, we try to then mitigate, which is when the authority will work with the communities to try to come up with mitigation measures and things that will help make whole as much as possible what we can with our impacts. Some examples of this are impacts regarding noise. Uh, we can use some design, design sound barriers. Um, we can use vehicle specifications or insulation to sensitive noise receptors, such as schools or houses. For construction, we can avoid nighttime construction in residential areas, which is often the case. Uh, we can reroute construction traffic to avoid less traveled roads and keep them on the main roadways. And then for operations, we can do things like rail lubrication to alleviate um, any kind of rail, wheel squeal or noise that you would hear on the tracks. For a visual, we can do things like transparent sound barriers. These are very much evolved from what you've seen maybe 10 years ago where they kind of turn yellow after a while. These stay clear and they actually work quite nicely. We can use um, architectural catenary poles, or we can do architectural treatments, um, designs on retaining walls you may have seen with Caltrans, or vegetative berms or buffers, and the authority will work with the various communities on bo both the noise and visual impacts to try to figure out which one fits the community best. So let me turn it over to Val and she can continue with our upcoming public involvement from here. Okay, we have been doing a number of different meetings, very similar to this, up and down the corridor. Uh, as you can see, we've been uh, in Rosemond, Lancaster, Tehachapi, obviously we're here tonight, and this is a live webcast, so hopefully we have some folks at home, and in fact, we know we do, because we do have some questions from, uh, some online questions, so we have some folks at home who are watching, and we appreciate that very much, because we're it's all about trying to make sure we're educating people. If, in fact, you have folks who you know, if you know someone who think uh, who you think would benefit from this information, um, 
We're also going to have another event just like this in Palmdale this coming Tuesday. So if you have a friend, family, neighbor, someone who you think, or if you want to do this again, you know, because all of a sudden you go home and you say, hey, you know what, I forgot to ask XYZ question. Um, of course, you can always call us or, or uh, submit a comment online or a question online. But or, you know, again, you can come down in, uh, to Palmdale uh, and join us on Tuesday. So uh, now, uh, what we want to do and what we've been doing is a facilitated question and answer period because uh, in addition to having your opportunity to have your one-on-one -on -one moment with your engineer or your environmental specialist, um, there are some folks who want to ask kind of, glo you know, kind of bigger questions. So uh, we do have question cards. If in fact you do have a question, I do uh, request that you fill out a card and we're happy to answer it. We do have some questions already in hand. Again, Claudia is here with more questions in her hand, actually. <laughs> Claudia is here with qu uh, question cards, so if you do have a question, please raise your hand and she'll uh, go ahead and hand you a card. So our first question is coming from a small business owner. Uh, she's interested in finding out about our small business policy. Um, if in fact, uh, we do have our panel over here, by the way, uh, for those of you online, uh, it's Michelle, Stephanie, Rick, and Juan Carlos, who you've already heard from, and they're gonna be, they are our specialists, our experts, so they will be answering these questions. But um, our stakeholder wants to know, what about our small business policy? Um, uh, how, if you're a small business, do you, can you participate in the project? And is there anything specifically, because we have a lot of small businesses who are supporting the project, and so her question is, what can we be telling people about the project? Michelle, this is probably right up your alley. I can't get the microphone out. Um, so we have a very, very uh, active small business program with the California State uh, High Speed Rail Project. We have a 30% overall small business contracting goal for everything we do on this project. Our website is a wonderful bounty of information on all aspects of our project, but specifically we have a small business section of our website that really can lay out for a small business owner uh, you know, all of the different kinds of opportunities that we have. We have also begun to register small businesses specifically with the authority so that you get notified uh, when we are in active uh, uh, procurements. Right now, we have over 300 small businesses working on the project up and down the state. Uh, over 120 of them are small businesses that are located within the Southern California section, which includes this southern area, Bakersfield South. So we are really, really excited to be able to um, bring small businesses into this project to make sure that Californians are building the California High Speed Rail Project because predominantly those small businesses are local businesses that are live that are located within the areas that we're building the project so we're really putting that expertise to work great and we're going to try to be efficient with our questions so we're, we're going to be moving along um, the next question will be is what will the source of the electric power uh, what will be the source of the electric power that will drive the train Juan Carlos yeah so the authority is um, is, is committed to being a very green uh, uh, Project. So we are committed to 100% uh, renewable energy uh, for our electric train. So we are looking um, particularly at, um, you know, in this area, uh, just south of here, we have a lot of uh, uh, wind and solar um, um, energy sources. So we're talking to PG&E and SCE and um, all the, the, the electrical providers up and down the state about how we get um, that green energy, that 100% that renewable energy for our train. And as I mentioned, um, our website, we also recently produced a sustainability report, which is available on our website as well, and I would really encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, based on all of the analysis that was done there, uh, the California High Speed Rail Program is the greenest project in the country right now. So there are so many policies that we're implementing. We really want to build a 21st century project in the 21st century, and we're really looking at uh, bringing all those tools to uh, what we're doing. Great. Okay, um, 
Sandra wants to know, what is the status of identifying the system operator? We basically went out for a procurement to hire an early operator. We are going to run through that process so we can get additional information about, uh, or additional, bring additional information into the program from someone who already operates trains somewhere else in the world because that is key in building what we're building. Uh, once we do that, we will continue to move forward uh, with the system. Ultimately, we will be hiring an operator that will actually run the trains. And that's well documented in our business plan right now. We are planning a business. When this system is built, we will have a private company come in and operate the system for a profit. Uh, so that's what our goal is. Um, so look for, look in the short term for our early operator to help guide us as we move towards that place in the future where we actually bring the operator on for the full system. Wonderful. By the way, if, if, in, folks, if in fact some people are, are tuning in now because they want to see the Spanish language uh, discussion, uh, we will get to that very quickly, uh, very soon. We are just trying to finish up some of our question and answers from our English uh, language uh, discussion, our presentation. Next uh, question comes from online. We have uh, someone from Rosemond who has dialed in and is asking, um, he has a property near Rosemont Boulevard and that may, uh, that may be impacted regardless of the alternative chosen. So he's wondering about timing. He, he wants, you know, obviously specificity. What date will uh, acquisition happen? Um, perhaps we'd want to go through the phasing of how, how, you know, what the process looks like. Yeah, so, so typically the um, property acquisition, the right of way process doesn't start until after we're completed with the environmental document. So uh, in this next year, we're gonna be doing the environmental document, and then once we get that, we, we get all our certifications and um, approvals, that's when the, um, that, that process could start. Uh, again, here, we're, you know, we're the, the funding is not identified yet for this section, so we're not certain about the exact timing of that, um, but that's typically the process that, that it would follow. Okay, we have uh, a question uh, from our audience here. One has to do with the possible route through the city of Bakersfield. We do have a rollout map over in the back of, of the room. Again, we're talking today about Bakersfield to Palmdale, which is a very specific section. However, understanding that we might have one or two folks uh, in the room who are interested in what specifically is happening in Bakersfield, we invited our sister uh, uh, team to come on in and make sure that they had their information here so that they could go ahead and provide uh, that information. The second question is, is there a possible year where this will start? So when do we anticipate operation? So we anticipate operating trains from uh, the Kern County area to San Jose in 2025 and operating trains from Anaheim to San Francisco in 2029. Uh, so that is our current plan. Okay. Just a couple other questions. Uh, Stephanie, what types of things will be studied in the environmental document? Um, the environmental document will look at all facets of the community. So we, we have a very detailed list um, on our website what we do look at, but we look at transportation, noise, air quality. We look at the socioeconomics of communities and community impacts. We look at um, flora and fauna. We look at water, hydrology, um, we, even things like electromagnetic interference. We look at hazardous material areas. So there's a, they're very large. We, we basically look at everything you can think of and put that into an environmental document. And based on that information and what has the least overall impacts overall and some other differentiators with talking with the community, some things that are important to them. And that's how the authority and FRA decide on what alternative they want to move forward with. Great. Uh, Rick, question on tunneling. Um, we've talked a lot about tunneling. Uh, is the tunneling that we're seeing in this section unique or are we seeing similar types of tunnels? Is this similar to something we've seen in other parts of the world and other systems? Yeah, uh, these systems around the world uh, 
involve a lot of tunneling. There's uh, over I think, 12 countries that have high-speed train systems currently in operation. Countries like Japan, uh, Spain, Italy, China. They have uh, you know mountainous regions uh, throughout their system, and uh, so there's a lot of high-speed rail tunnels like this. So Japan has one that's uh, 30. 32 miles long, I believe. It actually goes underneath the ocean, connecting two of their islands. Uh, the, the Spanish just built one that's about 17 miles long. Uh, so these are fairly commonplace around the world. Uh, not so much here in the United States, but uh, they are com very common on other systems around the world. Great. Two more quick questions. Michelle, uh, what specific changes have we seen in the community as we've developed the alignment? There have been, there have been adjustments. Um, so the question is, uh, what kind of changes have we seen specifically in the Edison area? So I think Juan Carlos covered some of them, but basically in this area, um, we have the uh, agricultural business. Uh, we have a school, we have uh, some community areas, and so, and, and then additional businesses located along Edison Highway. And so when we started looking at this project, um, we inherited uh, a plan that had the alignment traveling along Edison Highway throughout this area. And in analyzing that, there were a lot of things about that that required um, uh, impacts to the local, uh, the packing houses. Um, one of the things that I've learned is almost every baby carrot that probably anybody in the nation eats is actually processed here in this location. Um, so there are just like these amazing things happening in the community. And when we looked at that, and we looked at our needs for the project, we realized that if we were able to leave that Edison Highway area and go over to the 58 corridor, we could avoid the impacts to not only the agricultural businesses, but also move away from the Edison School where we are tonight, move away from some of these sensitive communities. And so really, it's a win-win for everybody. And that's a little microcosm of what we're doing up and down the alignment every day as we're working on the project. Great. And last question, Juan Carlos. Uh, the question is, is this system safe? Um, yes, it's very, it's very high-speed rail is very safe. As Rick mentioned earlier, um, they've been operating high-speed trains in, in Japan for over 50 years um, without a passenger fatality. Um, because of the elements that we've talked about, the all roads being separated so there's no uh, crossings of, of roads and trains where there can be an incident, we won't have any of those. Um, so that, that obviously is a safety feature as well. We will also have um, uh, what's called positive train control, which is um, a, it's, it's kind of like new cars now where they, they'll tell you, they'll brake for you if you forget to brake or they, you know, they have cameras all over the cars. Um, this is kind of the, the, the types of technology that will be implemented from day one on the train. So if um, operators or, or things like that are uh, make any errors or you know, are texting their friends while they're driving the train, the, 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 the train control systems will take over and prevent um, any incidents. Great. I think the key thing to remember there is trains are very safe, sometimes human operators not so much. And so we will have a fully um, electronic system that makes sure that the human drivers don't make an error. Great. Uh, on the screen right now we have our contact information. Uh, if in fact you want to reach us by phone or by email, please do so. We invite you to. Uh, you're able to make comments online, you're able to ask questions online, and we are pretty good at promptly getting back to you. So please do uh, reach out. Uh, and again, we will be in Palmdale in another, uh, in an, in, on Tuesday in another week. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate the time you're taking to find out about the project. It's important for us. We know it's important for you that we're, as we're, we're moving forward collaboratively, that we work together to, to create the best possible project. Thank you. Y uh, también, si quiere uh, ver la presentación en español, vamos a empezar en un momentito. Gracias.